So a lot of our viewers have asked us to cover Archimoto, which is a really awesome new startup here in the EV space. So I thought what better way than to hear the story firsthand from the CEO, Mark Fraunmeier. I'm Mark, I'm the, the founder and, and CEO of Archimoto. Um, I actually, you know, you, you said we're a, we're a new startup in the EV space. Actually, we've been cranking away at this particular problem since 2007. We're a 13 year old new startup in the EV space. The basic idea of Archimoto is to reconsider our, our basic pattern of transportation for daily trips. Almost all of us travel around our local areas on a regular basis. And the typical pattern here in the US at least is in full size cars, even though we're driving by ourselves or sometimes with another person, very, very rarely with more than one other person in our vehicle. And we're traveling usually a short distance with a, with a small amount of stuff. That disconnect between what we use cars for and what cars are capable of creates, when you multiply it by everybody, creates just this massive level of inefficiency. Really, Arkimoto is not about uh, trying to change your basic pattern, although you know, shifting to a bicycle, that's good. Get exercise, you know, good for the body, powered by burritos. Um, but uh, the, uh, the, the, the idea of Arkimoto is really just about the right tool for the job for daily trips. It was, it was initially just looking at the, the space between the bike and the car and saying, you know, why, why aren't there a whole slew of different products in this space? And then really honing in on, on what we think is one very ideal platform for a whole host of different daily trips. We then, you know, went, went from the basic idea through the looks like works like prototypes. We went public in 2017 in order to build out the factory and then launched production almost a year ago uh, here in Eugene, Oregon. We've now built more than 100 uh, uh, of, our, of our flagship fun utility vehicle. Uh, we've launched two new products. So the Deliberator, which is our solution for last mile delivery, basically gets rid of the second seat and the whole back half of the platform becomes storage. Uh, and then the Rapid Responder, which takes the, the benefits of, of the fun utility vehicle uh, which is, a, it's very maneuverable, you can slip through traffic, it's very easy to park, and it brings those benefits to emergency response and security. We paused production in March in, because of uh, the, the pandemic, and we have now resumed production and we're about to restart deliveries uh, as, we, as we look to much higher scale production over the next couple of years. That's Arkimoto in a nutshell as we, as we stand today. So the idea is, you know, really fundamentally, is new vehicle platform that is more efficient than cars by design. So even from the early founding days, was your goal and vision always to be electric? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. What really started the company was I was just, I, I had sold a previous company. My original background is computer games. So I was a yeah. computer programmer. And when we sold uh, Garage Games, I went looking for a vehicle. I, I knew I wanted electric. I mean, it was just crazy to me that we were burning gas uh, to go get coffee. Just, just totally nuts. Uh, the, the, the writing's been on the wall in terms of climate change and the risk that that poses for decades. And so, you know, making the shift to a, a drivetrain that is three times as efficient and has no tailpipe emissions is, is a no-brainer. Yeah, it completely makes sense. We did a video a couple of years ago on the Elio Motors car. You're probably familiar with that. It was kind of similar concept, but it was a gas car. And I was shocked by the amount of response and comments that we got. There's because there's clearly a need for people who are rethinking exactly what they need, just to your point. And for so many people, a huge sedan for five people isn't really the right tool if you're trying to just, you know, go get a, a grab a bike to eat at a lunch and come back. It's one of those things that once you see it, you can't really unsee it. And there's a there's an image that was produced by a, a sustainable mobility advocacy group where they took uh, uh, 200 people in 177 cars, and I think it was up in Seattle. And then they took those 200 people outside of the cars and they set them up in folding chairs going down the street. And that one image just shows you the amount of space that we take up for our vehicles is crazy. How do you see some of those patterns or behaviors changing as a function of COVID-19? Um, you mentioned the tech and the CS background. Um, I'm also in tech and pretty much every tech company has kind of said, you know, we're letting our workers work remotely for the next year or two. Some companies like indefinitely. I can't help but feel like this is going to really change so much of our daily lives from 
traffic and the rush hour commute and all that sort of stuff. I personally think the value proposition of something like what you're offering is as high or maybe even higher when you can be a little more distributed and you don't have to travel such distances. You don't have to have such like predefined patterns of, of travel. My sense is it's going to, I think, I think you're right. Um, I think it's going to change. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's a permanent shift. Not, it's not just like, hey, let's just all go back to exactly what we were doing before uh, once, once it's safe to do so. A lot of companies have moved to work from home for w- where they can. And we've done, that, we've done that. We did that in early March. And what we've found is that actually the tools for working together, collaborating together online are, have gotten so good and they are going to continue to get better that it's, we're, we're more productive. Uh, we can have, you, you, can, you can meet with somebody down in the Bay Area and then somebody in Chicago and then somebody in New York and then somebody else on your team in, in your hometown, uh, all within the span of a couple hours and have a very high fidelity, very real conversation. You can be sharing documents, collaboratively editing. And so I think for a lot of companies, Tech, tech is obviously going to lead the way there. They're going to start ditching their commercial office space and uh, really focus on making the, the home environment a, a, a really great environment to work in. And that will have dramatic impact on our transportation patterns. Because if you're not, if you're not commuting, then what are you cruising around for? Well, you're, just, you're moving around your, your local area. So transportation becomes more localized the focus becomes more on making the, the local area that you live in more habitable, uh, greater sense of local community. That will mean that the types of vehicles that we need are, are really changed. And also the, the shift to delivery, which has just gone exponential during this time, has, I think, really made our delivery platform a much, a, a much more long-term viable platform as well. That you've got just-in-time delivery, food delivery, grocery delivery, small parcels, and that really favors small, lightweight platforms that are super efficient that can get things to you fast. Right. So between like the last mile problem, the new rise of delivery, uh, whether it's takeout food or just parcel delivery, you guys are kind of poised to, to be at the forefront of all of that. We just got to build them faster. And I think that's, that's yeah. really where our focus is. is I, I think where, where we sit, we see the market opportunity as giant. And so are pretty much almost the entire focus of the organization is getting to scale. You guys are back on or are you going to be turning back on shortly? We are manufacturing presently and we're just about to restart deliveries to customers. Are you going to be kind of like supply constrained or are you going to be manufacturing constrained for the next like year or so? We haven't really put out new near-term forecasts post pandemic. We're going to just be as smart as we can about you know, one, we have, a, we have a, a bunch of orders in the backlog that we, we need to be fulfilling on. Uh, early customers who've been waiting for a very long time to get vehicles. And we have uh, pilot fleet op- opportunities that are coming together around our commercial and, and government products. But we're also you know, really thinking of how do we make sure that we step that up in a way that makes a lot of sense um, and that we're, we're putting very robust products in the hands of our early adopters at the same time that we're looking at once once we're ready, how do we go to much higher scale? You've been an investor for a while. You've probably caught the announcement that we're working with Monroe and Associates out of Detroit. That's their bread and butter is, is high volume uh, automotive scale products. And so we what we're really aiming to do now is to, is to tap into uh, the expertise that's really been a part of major global successes on scale production and bring that to this new platform. We sent them an Arkimoto and they, they promptly took the whole thing apart down to every last fastener, uh, bagged and tagged every little piece. And then we proceeded to go through a, a period of about eight weeks where we r- workshopped every part in every different subsystem to identify both near-term and then long-term cost optimizations and, and sort of how do, we, how do we go and produce this part or this assembly when we're looking at 50,000 plus units a year. Yeah, that's what Sandy does. That's, uh, <laughs> I don't know if he's, has he made any videos about that? Do you know? We actually did a, I, I did an interview with him um, a, a couple of weeks ago that we're about to put out um, where, where we went into a little bit of the detail on, on yeah. the collaboration and then sort of some of the other products that they've worked on that have been in a similar uh, similar space. Gotcha, yeah, I'll put a link to 
to the video you're referencing when it's available in the description. For our viewers, there might be some people who know more about it or less about it, but do you want to talk about kind of the powertrain or the batteries and the tech that goes into making one of these? Absolutely. So, so the Arkimoto is a, it's a reverse trike, two wheels in front, one wheel in back, uh, and you sit, uh, you sit uh, in tandem. So the driver in front of the passenger or the driver in front of the storage. And we, we chose that, uh, that high level layout uh, for a couple of reasons. One is just to have a smaller uh, frontal surface area from an aerodynamic point of view. The other is that we wanted to have a very small footprint for ease of maneuverability in the city and then parkability. Uh, and the, the, the vehicle is not much larger than a big touring motorcycle. So you can park it three in a parking space. It means uh, that you can park in spots that pretty much no car can. It's a convenience factor. Uh, that is hard to overstate for our consumer market. And then obviously for the delivery market, being able to park close to where you're picking up and dropping stuff off is actually just a, a cost advantage because it saves time. So that platform, uh, what, what probably differentiates us from most three-wheel vehicles that we've seen, uh, particularly reverse trikes, is that we are front-wheel drive. We're actually dual motor front-wheel drive. So uh, each of the two, we, there's no, there's no automotive style differential. The differential is a function of software. Um, and then, you know, there's, so there's one motor and one motor controller for each of the two front wheels. The back wheel is really just along for the ride. Um, and it, the, the, it, the platform has kind of a typical sports car style, uh, unequal length A-arm front suspension, um, and then a, a drag link linkage for, for the steering. So where it, we've really ridden a fine line between what people think of as typical of cars and what people think of as typical of motorcycles in order to really try and take the advantages of, of both uh, and bring them together into one product. Um, we, we initially went to a handlebar steering mechanism because it made the platform much smaller. So it, it, it shortened the vehicle by about two feet. Uh, when you're sitting on it in, in sort of city scooter style, you're sitting upright, uh, you don't have your legs kicked way out in front of you. So when you're sitting more automotive, you've got to make the vehicle a lot longer to accommodate tall people's long legs and then the throw of the pedals. That's really the overall platform. And that is what we have spent probably the most amount of time uh, refining from an engineering and design standpoint. Uh, on the battery side, the battery is, is runs down the main trunk, the main sort of chassis of the vehicle. And so the idea there was just get as that heavy weight, the, the heaviest weight component, which is the battery, get that as low in the vehicle and as centered as possible uh, so that the center of gravity is, is right where you want it. Today, we're using a pouch cell from a company called Ferrisys. It's the same cells that are in the Zero motorcycle, really nice, good power delivery, good energy density. And then we've, we've developed our own interconnect system for interconnecting those pouches um, it's, a, it's sort of a novel way of crimping bus bars, uh, and, and that, that comprises sort of the, the core battery tech. Uh, and then we're using kind of a blend, it's a, a switch reluctance, internal permanent magnet machine motors for the front wheels. And those go through a, a two-stage reduction gearbox that we've designed. So we're, we're buying motors, controllers, battery cells off the shelf. And then what we do is integrate all those into our platform. Single speed? Yeah, so it's single speed, uh, two, two parallel gear trains um, in the same gearbox chassis. It's, a, it's about a seven to one gear reduction from the motors to the wheels. Do you mention the battery capacity, like how big the battery pack is? It's 19.2 kilowatt hours. That's again, what, what sort of differentiates our approach from what we've seen in the electric car space is that we're, we're aiming to solve daily trips with a range that, that is plentiful for daily trips, 100 miles of city driving, uh, and to do that in as efficient and small a platform as we can. So it's, it's sort of, you know, if power to weight ratio is a good thing, you can either do that by adding power or removing weight. You either increase the numerator or decrease the denominator to make that number go up. Um, and so that way, by, by going for something that's a quarter, you know, we're targeting a quarter of the weight of a car, uh, you just need much less juice to push it down the road. So if I buy one of these and I want to charge it at home, what's the procedure? Do I need to get like a NEMA 1450? Do I charge on 110? I have a 110 outlet in my driveway and I plug in the cord and 
uh, have a full tank every morning. The, the thinking, you know, you know, now there's a certainly a much larger number of chargers out there uh, on the road, still nowhere close to say the number of gas stations uh, that dot the landscape. Um, but we were, we were really thinking that it, back in 2007, there was a real chicken and egg question around electric vehicles. And we just wanted to not have that. Do we need the charging infrastructure for this product to exist? Uh, for, for this product and for its, uh, its dominant use case, the charging infrastructure has been here for a long, long time. It's the, it's the electric power grid. So that, that was one of the factors that, that went into you know, the, the overall equation. What will be the, like, what's the charge port on the, on the car? It's the standard J, J plug, J1772. So it'll plug into a level two charging station. It'll plug into a normal 110 with a, with a J plug on it. We don't presently offer a, a, a DC fast charge option, although um, we think that'll be a, some sort of a higher capacity charging option is on the drawing board for, uh, particularly for the delivery product, uh, where, where we think that there'll be some fleets that are putting you know, a couple hundred miles on these vehicles a day, and they're gonna wanna have a, 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 a quick charge or a quicker charge option uh, to, get, to keep them in service. Do you have a fully enclosed variant? Well, the, the, it, you can think of it like a Jeep. So it, if the weather's great, take the doors off. It's a, you get that very fun in the world, uh, motorcycle-esque experience. And then if the weather's nasty, you can put the, put the either half doors. Uh, we actually just got uh, our, our, a full side enclosure option that's like you would have on an ATV or a, a, a golf cart or something like that. Um, we envision and have on the drawing board uh, sort of a full side hard shell uh, doors as well, although those won't look like typical car doors necessarily. But yeah, they, they, there's nothing about the platform that prevents it from being fully embodied. Um, it's just what, what we've found and, and, and what I found is that one, that, that fairing, just the, having the windshield and the roof does a very good job of keeping the weather off of you uh, we're in Eugene, Oregon. It rains all the time, um, and right. I've, I drove it year-round here with no problem. Uh, but I think we will definitely have customers who want, you know, more, uh, you know, to be more buttoned up, and that 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 is that is definitely possible and, and is is part of the plan. I was just asking because right now here in San Diego, it is really hot. It's been hot for about two, three weeks now, and I was just thinking it might be nice to have something that can kind of keep keep me enclosed. Does that have air conditioning, by the way? Yeah, we're, we uh, right now we have heated seats, heated grips, and a and a cabin heater that's part of the defrost. Um, we're actually looking at some interesting different cooling options, including just having cooled seats. So have keeping the you know the, the closer you can keep the cooling yeah. device to you, the less you're you're wasting energy. Um, right. And then you know you can always just throttle up a little bit in San Diego and get the get the side air air conditioning going in as well. That experience really of just being in the world um, is something that's that's really nice, uh, particularly when you have a vehicle that's quiet, uh, where you can talk to the person that you're with, you can right. talk to people around you. People are always pulling up on bicycles and uh, walking up, saying, "What is this? Where do I where do I get that? Where do I rent that?" Um, so, I, I really like the experience of being in the world. I've ridden motorcycles for about 12 years now. And um, when my wife told me we were pregnant with, my, with our first son, I decided to, I don't know, something got me to, to, to sell it. So when I see a car like this, I'm, I'm very interested. Uh, I think it would be kind of a good blend of, like, just like you said, kind of feel the road beneath you and some air uh, while still having all that extra safety that a motorcycle doesn't afford you. Do you guys sell like in Europe or Asia or anywhere else besides North America? Presently, the vehicle is only certified on the road in, uh, in the U.S. and then in New Zealand. Uh, but we, we definitely have global aspirations. Uh, and when you think about uh, the narrower streets and more dense urban areas and, and prevalence of smaller form vehicles in other markets, we think the Arcimoto would actually do very well in Southeast Asia, in Europe, in Africa, South America, so on. The plan is to get really dial in the production process and the product and the factory design, and then export, essentially export the Arkimoto factory all over the world. So um, I asked because I'm, I'm from India and 
I think a car like this is actually really common. And if you made it electric and all the other benefits, a little more safety, a little, little bit bigger, um, like in India, in, in some cases, this is considered a bigger car than what a lot of people already have. But I just wanted to ask you in terms of like just culturally, I've, you know, North America, especially in, in the U.S., I think you look on the road and people are driving like long bed trucks by themselves to work. And it's just I, I just can't help but wonder, you know, is there any sort of like cultural challenge? Because I, I just I feel like Americans do like their big cars. I think places like in Oregon or California, you're going to have people who, who want to have something tiny to get around town. Um, but what do you think about like the challenge of, of 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 appealing to people who want bigger and bigger and bigger cars? Apparently, well, I it, it's it's a it's a good question. Uh, what what I have found is that people who drive you know big trucks, off road machines, look at it and they go, "That looks fun. I like fun things. That looks like that's got kind of an ATV style. I like ATVs." Um, and so. It's, you know, we, we sort of think of it as, uh, as, as hippie certified redneck approved. It really hits the full spectrum. Um, and, and it's because for a, for a small form vehicle, like a, a bicycle, motorcycle, it's, it's big. It's, it's, it's got yeah. some stature on the road. You've got, um, you're sitting up at about the height you would in a crossover uh, SUV. You've just got this direct connection to the road. It's, it definitely has a, it, it has a much bigger feel of a ride than it is on the road. Um, so it feels, it gives you that feeling. And I think the, the American car market is, has definitely, the, the taste of it has gone to, is, is really focused on ride quality. And so that's where we, we have spent, I think a lot of that time over, over the you know, decade that we were in, in concept and looks like works like ideation and getting up to production. Uh, a lot of that focus went, went into the ride of the vehicle and the experience of the vehicle. I, I think that's going to be a, a good driver for adoption locally. What we've seen in the past are, are vehicles that are really all about making it much smaller uh, in a way that sacrifices the quality of the ride. My, my hope is that that allows us to succeed uh, it, where, where some other products have failed. Yeah, I think the really brilliant idea about Arkimoto and the FUV in particular is that it's not like a, you're not taking a sub ultra compact car, which nobody really likes. Nobody given a choice would want like the, I think it's like the Mitsubishi Mirage. Uh, I forgot what it's called. But anyways, the ultra, ultra compact economy car, because given a choice, you'd rather have something more feature fledged or bigger, more spacious, but that's a compromise. And in people's minds, especially Americans, I think the idea of compromising or having less of is it doesn't really appeal. So what this is, is not a, it's not a competitor to like the ultra compact cars for in the interest of like lower fuel costs or recharging costs. But this is a like kind of a lifestyle element. And to your point, it kind of has that ATV feel. So even if you're used to big pickup trucks, to have a chance to kind of get around town in something fun like this is, is, is fun. It's interesting. If you have a bigger car for your long road trips, keep it. This is how you get around town. Go to lunch, go to your meetings, do whatever you need to do uh, and have fun uh, all the while. Yeah, you, you you think of it initially. Well, I think a lot of our our, our customers will think of it initially as a, this is my second vehicle, and then they'll realize they're using it every single day, and their other car has been rusting for the last three weeks in the driveway, and and then the hope is that actually some of them will say, you know, if I'm only using that full size car once a month, why am I why do I own it? Why why should why isn't that going into you know a, a rental fleet that I can access when I need it? That's kind of the scenario that we had. We have our one non-electric car and our old uh, gas SUV. And we kept thinking, we'll use it for a lot of things when we need to all go together. Turns out we barely ever use it. It's really just kind of Home Depot trips and stuff. So there's definitely, there's some truth to that where people will rethink how they, especially when you go to pump gas, right? If you're, if gas prices rise again, which they may or may not, um, of course they probably will. Um, and you go and pump a big truck or an SUV and you spend $70, $80 here in California, that'll make you think twice when you can charge something like this for a dollar maybe or two uh, at home uh, during off-peak times. I think when that reality sinks in, the, the cost savings are pretty uh, dramatic. So wait, so you're saving money, you're having a blast, you're still doing all the things you need to do, you're not having to fight for parking in, the, in a giant rig. Um, You've sold me. 
<laughs> that's that's why uh, that's why we're here to get it today. Um, I actually wanted to ask you, being a motorcycle rider, can you can you park them like tail wheel to the curb like a motorcycle? Yeah, you put, you actually end up parking at about a forty five degree angle yeah. tail in uh -huh. first, um, and that's what gives you that three to a space capability. Yeah, that really appeals to people who live in cities. That was my favorite part about having a motorcycle is how easy it was to get around. Uh, when I was in college, I'd go to San Francisco, and without it, you'd spend two hours trying to find parking. So San Francisco is is a is a is a great uh, case study for for this vehicle. Yeah, I'm I'm sure there's there's a lot of you got uh, all those little tiny spots in between two driveways. You grab them all the time. I was going to ask you. So how could I test drive one, or how could I get in one and 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 experience one for ourselves? So you're down in San Diego, right? Yeah. Well. Um, we are, San Diego is where we're planning to have kind of one of our first um, major West Coast rental fleets and, and deployment fleets. So um, when, when, that, uh, when that happens, which is we're gearing up for, uh, for that presently. Um, and so uh, I'd, I'd be totally happy to connect you up with our marketing team and get you in the driver's seat down there. So when you say rental fleet, what, what does that mean? Is it like a like long or short-term rentals, long-term rentals? One of the questions always of, of, about electric vehicle adoption is how do you get a driver into the seat so that they can experience it and then decide that they, it's something that they want. The traditional model for automotive is franchise sales, uh, where a dealership buys vehicles and then uh, test drives them and sells them to customers. Uh, Tesla didn't want to have that intermediary in terms of both the margin hit and the brand experience. And so they went with the uh, direct sales and then company stores given test drives. We, we've sort of taken that and said, well, rather than just giving away test drives, um, and, and this is, is because it, this was not immediately obvious, but when we drove in pretty much every destination market, whether it's New York or DC or San Diego, the, you're constantly asked while you're driving, hey, hey, where'd you rent that thing? Where can you rent that? And so you're thinking, all right, Rentals, that's the way to go. So uh, we're, we're planning on opening up destination rental outlets. We actually have our very first one open presently in Key West. Um, and it's, it's a hybrid model. So, so like, a, like actually like Hertz, uh, where Hertz will own some of its own company rental stores and then franchise others. We're planning on doing basically that same thing. We'll have, we'll have some of our own rental outlets that we own. Others will be ones where our, our Franchise partners bring the capital and and actually own uh, the, their their particular territories for rentals. So if I liked what I saw as a rental customer, I would return the car and then buy it online. Is that the idea? It's we think that after you've had it for a half a day or a day, you you'll probably have come up with a long list of reasons why you want one of your own. Which which kind of brings me to one of my final questions, which is if I wanted one today and I ordered one today, how long do you think it would be before I would have one? Depending on where you are. So so West Coast will be sooner. Um, and then we're, we're planning to expand na nationally as rapidly as we can. Uh, the, the pandemic has certainly um, thrown a wrench into those plans in terms of the, the scale of that rollout and the scale of the rollout of our rental model. If you're West Coast, I'd say within a year, um, and then East Coast shortly thereafter. Our longest pre-order customer waited about 12 years uh, to get <laughs> his. Um, and so I understand the, the urgency and also uh, you know, caution, at least in the near term, a little bit of patience as we, as we really get up to speed. Um, longer term and kind of look at the future, there, there, are, there are a lot of different models of transportation that we're looking at. I've heard it described as the Cambrian explosion of different mobility solutions so new, new devices of all different size and shape. And then uh, the different business models that are attached to those, whether it's the, the, the limes and the birds that you can rent uh, by, by the minute, by the, by the hour, or the uh, more car to go, uh, you know, take it for a half a day, um, all the way up to different ownership models, shared ownership models. Those are all things that we are, are uh, ex exploring and think could be applicable to this platform. And then finally, uh, the, we, we also see this as, as an ideal platform for autonomous driving. So as, as that technology fully, fully matures, we think that the same for the same reasons that it makes a good everyday transporter for people and goods that it will make a, a very good uh, foundation for an autonomous transporter of people and goods uh, for, for the long haul.
So, so when did you, how did you find out about us? A friend, actually. Um, I have a friend who's obsessed with enclosed motorcycles and stuff, and uh, he's been threatening to build his own, but he, he had told me about Elio Motors 10, to, you know, some 10 something years ago. I always hoped that they'd be able to get, you know, to market. That didn't happen. You know, to that, I guess one other thing that, that might be worth adding is just that our approach has been um, by necessity and by style as, as capital efficient as we can possibly be. And so I think one of the things that has differentiated us um, fr from some others in the space is that our, our goal first and foremost was just to get the, a, a very simple, very robust product into the hands of our real customers uh, on, as, on as efficient a trajectory as we could. Um, and then really prove out the opportunity and, and, and prove out the, the, uh, the production processes before uh, putting a, a ton of capital behind a big scale step. And where we've seen some other ventures, you know, sort of never get to the starting line because to get into production required such a massive capital investment that th that the, the chicken egg of, of, of market potential market and capital intensity was never surmounted. We, we kept the money on the screen. Um, and then the fact that I was uh, the, the first and uh, significant investor, initial investor in the company sort of made me very conscious of every dollar going out the door. Yeah, it feels like it. That's part of why I, I decided to invest was because I like the clarity and the focus. You're not trying to build 18 models with 3D renders and like taking pre-orders. You've got an idea, you got a vision. It's a platform that you can build upon and you, you're starting to, right? There's the, the, the emergency response aspect, there's the delivery aspect, but it's all from this common platform. And as you build that out and it's robust and you're ready to scale it up all the way to hundreds of thousands um, that will eventually evolve but you've you've kept that focus which um, I've always said is what a lot of like entrepreneurs often lack is you can't get so obsessed with every possible opportunity that you get you drown in it right <laughs> um, exactly so that to, to answer your question that's why I, I really do think this is a sort of a company we need one of the most common comments I get in my videos is I love Tesla, but I'm nowhere near affording it. Maybe you're young, maybe a million reasons, but um, electric mobility is on the horizon. I think that's what people would rather be in. Having had an electric car now, it's hard to imagine. I would never buy a gas car again. You're right there in the right time, and there's there's going to be a, a clear need, and it's going to completely make sense for so many people. And your even your rollout strategy of of the rental model and getting exposure, really that's the key. If you, that's, Tesla owners always say the same thing too. If you just get somebody in a seat and give them a test drive, that's pretty much all it takes. Um, I think this is very similar too, because this is unlike, a Tesla is still a car, like you've driven cars before. If you've driven a performance German car, they're similar to that, maybe faster, maybe better, but this is completely new. So you really need to get exposure. And so that's why I'm so glad you had a chance to meet with you today. And um, I'd love to spread the word and just tell all our viewers, like if you haven't checked this thing out, you got to check it out. It's, uh, it's a, a really cool look at the future of mobility, I think. Well, hey, I, I really appreciate you having me on your show and uh, let's get you behind the handlebars sooner rather than later. I, that, that sounds good. I'll, uh, I'll be in touch. We'll make that happen. All right, thank you so much, Mark. I really appreciate it.